Hi, welcome to the Trauma Thrivers podcast. Delighted to have you with us. I'm Lula Bentz, your host, a psychotherapist, a trauma expert, and a survivor myself. Lovely to have you with us. The Trauma Thrivers podcast is for anybody who has been through any sort of developmental trauma or who has complex PTSD. This podcast aims to help educate, inspire and support those of us that are on a trauma healing journey. We've got stories, steps and various solutions to trauma to help you heal. If you'd like more information or tips or tools or strategies, please go to traumathrivers.com. You can also find this podcast on my YouTube channel, Lula Bent's Trauma Thrivers. If you'd like to join our community of thrivers, please find us on Facebook under Trauma Thrivers. Lovely to see you and lovely to see Masha who this is Masha Bennett for those of you that don't know her and I've known Masha for god do you think it's about 10 15 years um 2005 we met on the Was it? course <laughs> on which um, on the belief course belief yes belief. yeah yes <laughs> were you doing your training then as well um, my psychotherapy training, I think I, I, um, I've i done quite a lot of NLP training and EFT training by then. I started my psychotherapy training as such in 2006, so it was just after. Yeah, wow, okay. Working in, so, person, uh, in the drug rehab at the time, that's why I was doing the course. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So for those of... Yes, it's been... <laughs> Yeah, it, exactly, which is yeah, even longer. So for those of you of people that don't know you, could you start maybe, Masha, with a bit of your background and about you? And maybe, I don't know where you want to start, maybe with a little bit your story so that we can get to know you a bit. Okay, well, um, I am originally Russian. Um, as you can imagine, the last few weeks have been... Um, yeah. A really Very intense really difficult time well for obviously for ukrainians but also for russians who are absolutely horrified at what's going on so yeah it's been on my very much on my mind and whilst i feel very british i've been in this country for over 30 years now um these recent events have really been reminding me of my origins yeah Not in very nice ways no how, how have you been coping with it? Just because I don't want to jump straight on from yeah. there. Obviously, for anybody that's watching or listening to this, who are affected by it, or, you know, who might be Russian or Ukrainian or have family, or even those of us that aren't, how are you dealing with it? How are you coping? Or even, I, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on it all? Well, um, initially it was a big shock. So I yeah. think the first few days um, I possibly wasn't coping very well at all. But what really helped, um, I think the creativity, the sort of stuff that we're going to talk about today uh, has really helped. Um, you know, I wrote some angst-ridden poetry. I painted. I created some sand trays. And that really, really, really helped to process some of the big feelings around okay. um, what, what, well, what is still going on. Yeah. Um, I didn't particularly find talking about it helpful because I didn't have a lot of words about it. Um, but I, I, I wrote a couple of articles. I did actually post yes. in the group, I think, on Vicarious uh, Former. Yeah, you did, which was hugely helpful even just watching you know images i can't watch images on the television you know anybody who's a sensitive person and i'm guessing quite a lot of people in this group who are watching will have a level of sensitivity whether um whether they're therapists or lay people um people who are interested in this subject will likely to be fairly sensitive uh, to kind of shocking traumatic images and i think it's really important to of course, we have to be informed, but it's really important to protect ourselves from 
especially moving images of, of horrors. So yeah. I've had to do that for myself. You know, I, I listen to the headlines. I can't really go into the detail of it. Um, otherwise, I just wouldn't be able to function. Yeah. So, so that's, that's how um, I've been coping so far. Uh, we have invited the Ukrainian refugee to stay with us, so hopefully that will happen soon. So I feel that's amazing. You know, I, so that sense of helplessness is a little yeah. bit because I'm, you know, I'm yeah. trying to do something. There is so little, perhaps, that we can do, but I think if we can be a little bit proactive in whether I don't know, making a small donation or um, or supporting people in whatever way, I think it does really help to reduce yeah. that vicarious traumatization. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's some form of control, isn't it? Or being able to do something rather than kind of be frozen in shock. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the kind of the, the fight. <laughs> yes, yes. Get some active going. Shock. The, if yeah. we can fight in some way, you know, symbolic, if not literal, uh, then it helps us not to not to flop and not yeah. Not to dissociate. So, yeah. And yeah, so, um, so. um, Masha, do you have family still there? What are your ties back there? And did you did you grow up there? I mean, uh, yes, I spent first twenty years of my life in in, in Moscow. Uh, my my dad, uh, my dad and my brother still in Russia. I've got my sister lives in in Finland. Um, so so yes, again, they're quite horrified at what's happening and. Um, um, like I think, like most people who have access to good information and yes. desire to access it, because obviously a lot of people don't have access or don't know that they could learn something different. So, so yes, um, so that's about the last few weeks. But um, I was actually going to start my story with Moscow Zoo. <laughs> You were going to start your so so. I mean, thank you for sharing that with us. And I mean, we can't we can't not talk about it. Of course, that you is know. Important. Um, it, yeah, it has been well the the running theme of the the last few weeks. Certainly for me, um, you know, for clients, for students, but personally for me, very very strongly. So. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it is impacting on me still, but I am okay with not being okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good, good. Well, that that's one thing I hope that we learn through being therapists, isn't it? Is that we're okay, we we can stay with it and sit with it. And you know, the only reflection that I say, and I I have a very dear client of mine who is is Russian as well, is that, uh, you know, it's about one Russian. It's just about one Russian. You know, and there's there there are there are bad pennies in lots of our cultures, in lots of our countries, and you know it's just sad that he's managed to climb to the top. Yeah, absolutely, and how yeah. devastating it is for millions of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I know I know this sounds awful, but I do wonder in this day and age, and this is probably terribly on PC, and I'm sure I've said it before, but why leaders of countries or nations or even you know huge companies don't have to go through any sort of psychological testing mm. for their their ability to lead in a kind of humane and wise fashion that's a very very good question if i was a tyrant if i, I would be a very benign tyrant i would <laughs> I, I can't imagine you ever being a tyrant, Masha. Oh, I can assure you I have a little Mr. Putin. Uh, <laughs> sometimes he comes up as Darth Vader. I've got that part of me. <gasps> Could be a tyrannical megalomaniac. Mm. I think all of us potentially have that. Yeah, and yeah. That is really important and really noticing that shadow, that part of us that needs to control and overpower. Yeah. You know, be on top and all that yeah so i think I, I think that's the problem people who are in charge they're not recognizing that shadow you know unless they had therapy unless they've done a lot of personal development and yeah. even if they have done it doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean doesn't necessarily so yeah people get taken over by that yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah uh, i was a tyrant i would introduce that rule <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Or maybe you just would be in denial and wouldn't even recognize that, you know, anybody or you had issues and absolutely. Yeah. And that, I think that's what happens. The, you know, that that old phrase about power corrupting. Yeah. Yeah. So what 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 thankfully were your first? To be. <laughs> thankfully, I'm unlikely to be that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not this time around, anyway. Not this time around. So, so what were your t first twenty years like growing up in Moscow? Um, well, I thought I was living very, very happy uh, life in this wonderful Soviet state, which was so much better than anywhere else in the world. Totally brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did go to a special school. It was a school where we started learning English quite early. I was eight when I started learning English, which was very fortunate, um, which eventually allowed me to communicate and, you know, come to England and be able to talk to people. Um, so, um, and so we, we actually met some foreigners when we were uh, school children and and I was feeling so sorry for these poor foreigners I think there was this French lad and an Italian lad and I was like oh these poor French and Italian they're being oppressed by their uh, capitalist governments and I didn't know why they laughed at me when I expressed my sympathy for them <laughs> <laughs> brilliant so the, who was who was in power in those days? Uh, Brezhnev, and then there was a quick su succession of uh, I think Andropov and Chernenko, or the other way around. I can't remember. They only stayed kind of a year each, and then it was Gorbachev. So that's when things changed. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was a teenager then, and it was a very very exciting time. But I was never interested in therapy, in healing. It was totally alien to me. I was an amateur zoologist since I was about two or three. You know, oh wow. I'm in puddles looking at tadpoles and poking them with a stick and <laughs> collecting caterpillars, um, making a little zoo in my home. My mother had must have been an angelic patient, you know, had rats and snakes and Ooh. dogs and cats and fish and lizards and all kinds of animals in a tiny, tiny, minute little flat. <laughs> so, wow. Um, so one of my first, well, my first proper job was in Moscow Zoo. Uh, I worked in a zoo aquarium. Crikey. So, and, and that's actually, that's the reason why I came to UK. Uh, I met my, uh, well, now ex-husband, um, was visiting the zoo at the time and we had a romance how lovely <laughs> and how then lovely. I came over uh, to uk and and when i moved here um i noticed all the beautiful gardens and all the beautiful flowers and i got very much into gardening and to into horticulture and botany and i was completely obsessed and i did the rhs diploma in horticulture i did um my degrees in botany and plant science. I did oh. plant science at Aberdeen University. Um, so I was going to work with plants. Yes. Uh, and um, I did a little bit of writing. Um, a little, I did a little bit of ghost writing for somebody um, of some gardening articles. So somebody fairly well known, I wrote some gardening articles for them. Um, and I applied for a job as a trainee horticultural journalist. And I was at the top of the list, kind of, I was one of the two top candidates and I didn't get it. Oh. And I cried for three days. Oh, I'm sorry. Terrible, I really wanted that job. But the job I did get instead was in a prison um, as a horticultural instructor. Oh. Um, and that was the first ever time I, worked with people and I never ever planned to work with people I had quite severe social anxiety I really didn't want to go anywhere near people if I could help it you know things that were green or furry or sick. yeah yeah great but people were just Ugh. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. amazing and in that job in that gardening job um when I started working with the prisoners I I found that I really was able to connect with people and that people were actually quite interesting it was a total total surprise 
um, because that was not part of my plan. No, I, I love it because I've written down here, I was trying to think of a link and I've written down pets, plants, people and prisoners. <laughs> Oh, all peas. Very nice. I love it. I love it. So you, yeah. Um, so, so that was really special. So mm -hmm. um, when I looked for my next job, um, I found one in probation service. So I spent a few years doing group work and probation service uh, in Manchester. And then I found a job in a prison, in a style prison near Manchester. First, I was facilitating um, drug rehabilitation groups, uh, and then um, then I was managing the drug drug rehab for. Gosh. For, uh, so, so that was that was an incredible experience. That work, yeah. was, and you know, I've not I've I've not been back for a while, but I would love to go back to prison again. As a member of staff, ideally. Yeah, not 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 as an inpatient. Not as an if if I can help it. even. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed that work because um, people in prison are so appreciative of what you offer, I find, and um, because what's on offer is potentially limited. I don't know if things have changed consider considerably now. I do know some organizations that do some very, very good work in prisons, but I think it's quite patchy. Yeah. So. Um, so yes, I think it's very important work. If we can do enough healing work in schools and in prisons, then the world would be a better place. Definitely. Much better, much better. And so from the prison and working in the drug rehab and all the rest of it, you started doing your training in psychotherapy, which yes. is when we met. And yes. then, then, then what, what's kind of happened really over the last 15 years to your career and and I guess to your own trauma healing journey as well because I, I'm not being funny but well maybe I am most therapists I know or healers do have a little bit of their own work to do as well yeah. <laughs> and not a little bit <laughs> yeah so, um, so yes when I was working in the prison that's when I really began to appreciate how much learning there is to do. I've already had some training. We did do some basic CBT training as part of the this drug and alcohol work. And uh, I've trained in EFT by then, which is one of my favorite tools, the tapping. And I've, I began to teach it um, uh, at the time as well. And consequently, I did teach it in, I think it's about nine, 10 countries around the world. Wow. Uh, I was... Um, I, I was really, really keen on sharing it. And I still absolutely love it, even though my interests have moved somewhat. You taught it to me, Masha. I do remember, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. At the National yes. Centre for Eating Disorders yes. with Deanne, our friend Deanne. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Deanne was a big uh, advocate and uh, we might organise another course this oh, year. Oh, amazing, amazing. I'm getting it. I don't have any dates scheduled, but people keep asking me, so... Diana and I might possibly get together to do it again, which will be which will be great. Yeah. Um, so whilst I already had some skills and I was able to to help people, I realised just how much distress, how much trauma there was, how much it was underlying all these issues that brought people to prison. You know, the addictions, the violence, the victimisation. Yeah. Um, it was. It, to me, it was really, really obvious that these people were suffering, desperately suffering. And if they had appropriate help, you know, the stuff that happened that brought them to prison wouldn't have needed to happen. No. Yeah. I and it's, it's kind of, it's a rosy view that, you know, you can give people healing and they'll be all right. It's, a, it's much more complicated than that. But I think it can make a really big difference, consistent, good quality therapeutic support you know whether one-to-one -one or group can have such a huge difference for people so so uh, that's why I decided I must train properly so I did my psychotherapy training uh, it was neuro-linguistic psychotherapy same as me yeah um, and there's only a handful of us isn't there in yeah the there's not that many of us yeah <laughs> very so um 
there's a lot of NLP courses, but I don't think that there's no NLP psychotherapy courses um, in existence at the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, and I was just so greedy for learning. I just kept learning whatever I could find. Um, and at one of the NLP conferences, I won a prize. I never win prizes. I once won a box of beer and I don't drink beer. So, you know, so <laughs> it wasn't a good prize for me, no. you know. So, um, but that was a very special prize. I put my card in a box and I won uh, a coaching course, um, an executive coaching course with Sally Vance. Um, okay, yeah. She's lovely. She is absolutely brilliant. And it was worth, at the time, it was 2005, actually, I think the year I met, met, met that was worth something like two and a half thousand pounds, huge money. Uh, and I won it for free and it was amazing. So, um, and on that course, which was absolutely great, I don't do executive coaching. It's not what I offer as a, as a rule, but obviously I, I did gain from it and gain the skills. But one day of that executive coaching course was coaching in the sand tray. And I was, I've never heard of such a thing. Um, and I was really, really taken by it, really taken by it. It was actually at the time when I had to decide whether to accept that offer of the management job in the prison because somebody else, a good colleague of mine, was hoping to get the job, but they didn't offer it to her. They offered it to me and I felt awful. I was completely mortified. I wanted the job, but I really didn't want to upset my colleague because I really cared for her. And, and it, was, it was a terrible dilemma. So um, I put the situation in the sand tray with different little figures and objects and symbols. And I had a look at it with the help of my kind of other trainee, co trainee coach. Um, and it helped me resolve that conflict really, really quickly and effectively. So, so that really hooked me. Um, and from that, I only had one day training, which is not very much, not enough, I should say. Don't do it. Don't do one day training and start offering sand play to people. I did, I was wrong. <laughs> But don't do it after the one day training do at least a two day introduction that's yeah. my advice yeah, yeah. A two day introduction um and i got myself a cat litter tray in which i put some sand <laughs> i collected a box of different various objects um you will see that i'm in the room where i've got a lot of wow what are on those shelves because i can see that they look full to the brim yeah. of lots of things, but can you give us an idea of what is actually on those shelves? Because we can't really see. So um, I could bring my computer a little closer in a moment just to show, but I will explain yeah. about, um, what we do in sand play. Basically, you can think of it perhaps a little bit as a three dimensional art therapy, uh, but instead of a piece of paper or canvas or whatever you might draw or paint on, uh, you have a sun tray. So I'm going to show you one of my sun trays. Let me see. There is one on the floor. So it's a wooden oops, that's a box. Tray. You don't use a cat litter tray anymore then? Not anymore, no. I use some very nice wooden trays that my partner makes for me. <laughs> so um, it's a shallow wooden tray. It has to be as beautiful as possible, not a cat litter tray, unless, unless you really really skint and you need something very cheap and it's okay to start with a cut litter tray. Um, but because the sand tray becomes like a container for our soul and our soul deserves the best, it ideally needs to be as beautiful as possible. Right. The bottom of the sand tray is painted blue and sometimes the sides so that if people want to, they can create water by moving the sand so they can have a lake or um Lovely. A river or a stream or an ocean um and then we have dozens or hundreds or thousands perhaps i'm not quite sure i've not counted <laughs> um different little objects and the variety of objects needs to be such that you can create a world 
And it doesn't mean that you need to have a room full like I do. Yeah. Uh, just a few handfuls of little things. It could be pebbles, little shells, little pieces of wood, um, old toys, broken jewelry, you know, any unwanted ornaments that you don't like, you know, clothes, pegs. It could be literally any small object that could fit into the sand tray. So if anybody after this gets interested and excited about this, um, you can actually fairly quickly, unless you house is very very tidy and doesn't have any clutter you can probably find a good few handfuls of small objects that you don't really use or need but that could make excellent sand play <laughs> symbols so basically you create a world you create a picture in the sand tray uh, of what's going on for you of how you're feeling and typically you would start without any instruction you just do it spontaneously so from a large collection like mine people will have a look around on the shelves and see what draws them what attracts them what pulls them um, and they collect those symbols in the basket put them in the sand tray and then we may talk about it or not depending on what client wants. Uh, occasionally, uh, because I use the uh, method uh, of working with the sand called integrative sand play, which is a little bit different from other types. There are some types of sand play where uh, there is very little kind of discussion, very little talking about the sand tray. Okay. Uh, it's very non-directive. So the original Jungian sand play is very non-directive. The therapist will virtually they will never tell the client what to do and will not necessarily usually will not ask any questions okay about the sand tray whilst there are some quite directive methods of working with the sand where the therapist can actually instruct the client to do a certain thing in the sand tray and could ask quite direct questions and in int integrative sand play which I have largely trained in, even though I have also trained in Jungian sand play as well. Uh, I kind of use a combination of the two, depending on the client. I find that some clients um, are happy to work in almost in silence and do their own thing. And my presence there is enough, whilst other clients do need some interaction, you know, as additional support. They need some even though the value of the uh, sand work is as nonverbal therapy is particularly important to me. So it is a nonverbal, it's an embodied therapy. Um, I find some people do need some words, ju even just simple reflection um, um, of what, what they're doing in the sand train, what they might, might be saying. Uh, it helps them to stay afloat. Uh, because even though it looks very simple and it looks like somebody's playing and it may feel playful, potentially people can go really, really deep um, quickly. So it does need to be very, very safely held. Okay. Can you give us some examples maybe of actually what might happen and, and maybe explain to people who are watching why symbols or or metaphors or because I'm, I think people are probably trying to get their head around how does it actually work? How does it work? Okay. <laughs> well, I like to think that it works like magic. Uh, we like a bit of magic. However, however there, there, there are some more sensible answers. So um, when we cope with our life's suffering, with our pain, with our traumas, inevitably, we're not able to connect to all that information. It wouldn't be safe. So most of that information is stored in the implicit memory, in the body. So it's not consciously available to us all the time. Sometimes it's because, you know, at least part of that suffering, that pain belongs to the pre-verbal stage to when we were very little or maybe we were even in the womb. So the conscious memory of what happened then just isn't available, uh, you know, so we cannot, it's not like I can think, uh, what did I have for lunch yesterday? You know, I had a salad and, and some raspberries, you know, I'm bringing that up consciously, um, that is available for me, but a lot of our suffering 
that happened a very long time ago is not available because our brain at the time wasn't developed enough to retain those kind of memories. And even in later life, in, in later childhood and adulthood, um, our um, memory is very selective in what's, what it is keeping uh, explicitly available for us. Um, and we have all kinds of coping strategies to keep down and suppress things that are causing us suffering simply because we would otherwise be too overwhelmed because most of us had enough stuff happen to in in our lives especially if we're sensitive people um, and some people are more sensitive than, than others this is uh, this is a fact we're born more sensitive um, and some some people are born a little bit more thick skin for example uh, my little granddaughter, who is nearly three now, she is quite a tough little girl. She's is she? Thin, yes. <laughs> um, like she's not bothered by loud noises. She's very confident in herself. When she gets upset, like when she hurts herself a little bit, you know, she will, she will recover quite quickly. Whilst my yeah. little grandson, who is only just over a year old, he is quite a sensitive little boy. You know, he needs his mom. Yeah the time he gets startled by noises so we even very very early on you know sometimes we, we can distinguish a child who's more sensitive than uh, i don't know whether it's average or because i don't yeah. know how evenly or not evenly this is split but a significant proportion of us are sensitive so even little things that happen to us when we're young can be really significant like i don't know losing your favorite toy uh, or maybe accidentally breaking your mother's favorite mug or something. Even if you weren't told off for it, it could still be a really scary, uh, traumatic experience for a young child. And if you were told off for it, if you were shamed, if you were punished for it, you know, that could be even more significant. Yeah. It may not fit into the category of what many kind of lay people think as tra uh, trauma, but it certainly adds to that volume of that suffering that pain that we carry with us unless there are safe adults present at the time uh, and available at the time in an appropriate way to help you process yeah. that distress. so we keep accumulating the distress and we have to keep finding all kinds of ways to manage it and that will include all kinds of compulsions like all the standard drinking smoking overworking going on too many courses which i'm known for um uh, buying too many gongs or sand play symbols <laughs> um and um and some of these things are not socially acceptable like like drinking taking drugs drinking in excess and taking drugs and getting into trouble and going to prison so these things are judged by the society but other things like overworking and over helping and over caring they're very much encouraged yeah. by the society so yeah. um so it may appear that there is nothing wrong it may appear that why why am i suffering you know i'm i'm a good person i've had a normal childhood um, I've, you know, I do everything I need to do. I'm responsible. Uh, I'm not stupid. So why are things feeling rubbish? You know, why does it, why do I feel bad? Uh, why do my relationships fail? Or why do I keep getting depressed or angry or whatever? So, and any creative therapy, and that's not just sand play, I just particularly enjoy uh, sampling, I think it's just wonderful. Any creative therapy helps us to externalize those things that are on the inside that are not visible. Um, because it is your body, it is your hand that chooses those symbols. Um, it is your body that creates the picture. And the body knows, the body doesn't lie. Your hands do not lie. You know, somebody might place uh, an object in the sand tray and they might have never done it before. They might have no idea. Why, why did I just, why did, why did I choose that elephant? What's the elephant about? 
but they will know that that elephant has to sit in that exact place in that exact position or if it isn't then they might need to move it by by an inch or two uh, so the person will know exactly where things need to go and um and when you observe it as a therapist, you can make some educated guesses on what's going on. But the reality is we don't know. All we know that some really deep processes are happening. And some of the symbols will have some more obvious meanings. They might be more obvious to the client. They might say, oh, this is my, my husband. This is my auntie. This is my dog. So they might actually name the symbols and make them into certain people and at the same time even if they make the symbol be something else each symbol will be part of themselves at the same time and they don't need to consciously know what it means but by the symbols doing whatever they do in the sand tray um, somehow that unconscious information that library of stuff that we haven't touched it it is touched and it has a chance to become uh, more available and that energy of that old stuff that's been kind of a press down and um the, I find in particular when I do a good piece of healing my level of energy increases and it just reminds me how much energy it takes to push things down. So, yeah. so do people move their symbols and interact with their symbols and work in the sand with their hands? Or do, do they have spaces where they sit back and reflect? And do emotions come up for them? Do they cry? Do they what 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 do you kind of witness when you see somebody doing it? Everybody's different. I'll just describe what typically happens. Typically, uh, children um, have things moving in the sandry all the time. So children tend to have moving stories. Um, so um, if you can imagine their unconscious is very, very active and it's and it's not as sluggish and suppressed as it is as it is in adults. What adults tend to do um, they they will tend to create a picture and it will be still it you know it's almost like a snapshot they may move a few things around just to make sure they're in the right place but otherwise um the picture tends to be still though occasionally some adults will do quite a lot of movement but more typically it'll be still picture they will look at it i will invite them to tell me a little bit about it uh, and some people talk a lot, some people um, talk very little, some people have quite a good conscious understanding, you know, as they create a picture, they begin to understand what different things mean. And with those insights, often strong emotions come up. Sometimes strong emotions come up, even if it's not obvious what it's about. So they might say, well, I don't know why I'm crying, but looking at this little fish in this pond, I have no idea, but it just makes me really sad or it really moves me or it makes me happy to look at this. So um, emotion will come up sometimes with an insight, sometimes without. Okay. Um, so depending on who I'm working with and kind of intuitively, I may or may not ask some questions to help them explore. Uh, sometimes it feels it's best left kind of as untouched as possible because the sand tray will do its own work. You know, the sand trays I've made, how many years ago now? About 12, 14 years ago. Um, I still learn from them. I still think back to them. I still get new insights. You know, wow. I, I remember one of my early sand trays I've made and it was about a little frog that was on a journey. And it was, that was, that was a moving sand tray. The little frog did hop around the sand tray quite a bit. <laughs> Um, and it was looking for a treasure and it just couldn't find the treasure. Um, and I remember sitting and weeping over the sand tray and I was weeping and weeping and weeping. I had no idea what was going on, no clue. Um, and looking back on it, I'm still taking some, 
some insights and some learning and probably some healing from it yeah. even now. Yeah, even now. Yeah, even now. Who, who would you say, Masha, because I know that you're trained in lots of different modalities and things and have lots of experience. Who would you say this work is, is right for, is good for? What sort of uh, people listening or watching to us would... Is it something that if you're drawn to it or how do you feel about this in comparison, I guess, to the other things that you've yes. studied? Well, I'm probably a little bit biased, but I would say um, this is probably good for most people and even including people who are not drawn to it. So if we are kind of very stereotypically, some people a more kind of left brain, logical, analytical, you know, I, I used to be that, all my family are nuclear physicists, I used to be a scientist, I studied biology, botany, so I, I can very much relate to the left brain thing, you know, when on my psychotherapy training, when the trainer made a statement, I would tend to ask very earnestly, is there a research paper for that, you know, <laughs> so, so I wanted to have a research paper for everything. Uh, it, things have changed. So somebody who's very logical, analytical, they would not necessarily be drawn to sound play that think, oh, what's that, this is for children. Yeah. Um, however, they often do really, really well in terms of um, being able to connect with the body, connect with the unconscious, because they may have not have other means of safely doing so because if we're very very left brain very analytical um, it can feel dangerous to connect to our body to our emotions yeah and it, it can throw us out of our window of tolerance quite easily because it just feels too much to feel um but because we have the container of the sun tray and hopefully the container of the therapist <laughs> in the first place, there is a container of the sand tray and each little symbol, each little object is a container in its own right. It, yeah. you pro we project our feelings, thoughts, uh, intuitions onto them and they kind of hold them. So, um, so even some really deep stuff that we don't want to know anything about can be projected safely. And you don't have to know anything about it. You know, you might not understand what the, this picture is and that's okay. It can still do its work without our conscious awareness. Wow. Um, so I think it's really good for people who are very logical and it's brilliant for people who are very right brainy, very flowy, very touchy feely, very kinesthetic. They tend to love the sand tray. You know, I've only come across um, a couple of people for whom it wasn't the right thing. You know, I had somebody who had very bad eczema on their hands and it physically wasn't comfortable. And someone who found that touching the sand kind of was overwhelming for whatever reason. I don't know if yeah. there was any kind yeah. of sand related trauma, which is which is possible. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people love the touch. Obviously some people might not like the touch of the sand. And we can use either dry sand or wet sand uh, during the COVID times. I've, I've stayed away from wet sand. Yeah, yeah. Less, less hygienic than dry yeah. sand. Um, but that's very, very different texture, very different yeah. quality. And the sand, um, I, I write a blog on creative therapies, including sand play. And um, I've got an article on the symbolic qualities of the sand. So it's not just the symbols. Um, so each a little object will potentially carry symbolic meaning. And it doesn't matter if the client doesn't know about it. It doesn't even matter if I don't know about it, because uh, if you believe in such a thing as a collective unconscious or, or more morphogenetic fields or all those things, that the information is out there um, and we can kind of tap into it and connect to it. So for example, people will often use a phoenix the bird that rises yeah and they would use it very appropriately in their sand tray but they don't know that it's a phoenix they just think it's a red bird you know that's very very common um and um so the, the sand itself has got multiple symbolic qualities if you think of how many 
million, there are probably some billions of grains wow. in the sand, of the sand in, in my sand tray. Um, and so it's a symbol of multitude, of infinity. Um, sand, uh, normal kind of play sand, and that's the sand I use, ordinary play sand that children have in their, play, uh, in their sand pits. Um, it's typically quartz sand, and it tends to be derived from granite rocks. Okay. So, and the sand grains have been around for about 50 million years. 50 million years. These little grand sand, sand grains in my, in my tray have been around for at least 50, 50 million years and some other tens of millions of years as a granite rock. So they're timeless. Yeah. They're full of time. Yeah. Um, also, if if you or anybody listening into crystals, you know what quartz is. Quartz is a master healer that amplifies the energy, if you believe in such a thing. Um, yeah. So there are millions of little grains of quartz in the sand. Um, sand is also a symbol of the earth. Um, so if you think of the four elements, the earth, air, fire, water, it's a symbol of the earth, um, earth mother. So it's a symbol for mother. So it holds, you know, for those of us where motherly holding wasn't 100% right uh, or really was very wrong, um, we take something from the inside. We take a bit of our soul from the inside and put it into this safe container where it's being held by this symbol of the earth, of the earth mother. Um, and yes, as the granite rock gets weathered by water and air, so there's also symbols of water and air. And many people will use sand like water. They would kind of make it flow and then make rain out of the sand. And granite rocks, uh, I, from the little of geology that I remember, they're igneous rocks, so they created in volcanic processes. There is fire there as well. So sand is a very, very magic. Very important. And, and how many sessions would somebody typically do in this? Oh, that's very tricky. I do one-off sessions. Not all okay. therapists will do one-off sessions, but I've seen one-off sessions being really, really valuable. A classic Jungian sand play therapist would um, typically insist that you need a series of sessions so that you can, so that things change from session to session and um, the symbols have a chance to transform and that process of individuation has to happen over a period of time. And that's absolutely wonderful. You know, if people can commit uh, to that, one good thing about uh, sand play, you don't have to do it every week or every fortnight. I find the sand trays stay with you for a long time and they work with you for a long time. So I think actually about a monthly session tends to work really quite well. well. Uh, but I have seen occasions where single session um, was transformational for somebody. You know, okay. certainly, you know, I, I've done my own work on my own quite a lot. I've done a lot of sand trays on my own, which is a wonderful way of, kind of self-care and self-healing. Um, but it's not quite the same as doing it with a therapist. So the, the trays I've done with therapists have been kind of sporadic every now and then. Yeah. Um, but that still, even just an occasional tray has been uh, beautiful. And maybe maybe I'll, I'll tell you about my Pocahontas sand tray. It's a, it's a wonderful story of manifesting. You know, I'm not a big fan of manifesting because I think the law of attraction has got a lot not to recommend it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How it's being misused. Yeah. You know, I find a lot of people kind of a, get blamed for not getting better or not getting with what they want or not taking responsibility. I think that's rubbish. You know, yeah. yeah. I, I do believe we do our best. Um, and you know, we heal the best we can and we take action the best we can. Yeah, so I'm with you on that. I don't think there's any place for blame or you didn't visualize it vividly enough or so. However, I did manifest my dream house and my dream garden. <laughs> in Amazing. The yeah, so, so I'll be happy to share that. That was, I think, 2012. I was doing some of my 
uh, main uh, training in, in integrative sand play and I was having some personal sessions. I went to see a therap the nearest therapist was two hours drive away and I kind of went to see her religiously. Uh, I think for six sessions and on uh, my last session, my sixth session, um, as usual, I would, um, what I typically did, you know, I've been trying for years and years to find a little house with a beautiful garden of my own, even though I wasn't working anymore with plants, I was just desperately wanting a woodland garden. Um, and me and my partner were looking for somewhere together, um, but we couldn't afford anything that was vaguely resembling what we wanted and anything we could afford really wasn't wasn't the thing yeah so, and I started grieving uh, about my lost hope really I, I lost the hope at that stage and I would be uh, weeping over my sand trays where I would create these beautiful gardens with a little house and you know a little woodland and the, and the birds and the trees and flowers, and I would sit there and cry over these sand trays kind of giving up on my dream and this last sand tray so it was a little bit similar I had a little house in the middle with some little stones around it and some trees and some wizards and fairies in the backyard um I think I was trying to summon the magic yes <laughs> yes time. Um, and there was a stream there was a stream running on the uh, right hand side uh, with a Pocahontas you know from Disney movie uh, floating in her canoe on this stream. Uh, so I cried over the sand tray. That was our last session. Um, and next day, I found a little house. Oh, amazing. How with, brilliant. With a stony drive and the trees and the stream in exactly the same position as it was in my... And there was no Pocahontas in it. There was no Pocahontas. There were no wizards or fairies in the oh. backyard. But that sand tray, I, I wrote a little article about it. It's on my blog. That sand tray, those people who have been to my garden, it kind of looks pretty much that. But yeah. what's more interesting, I used to live within walking distance near that place for about nine years in two different houses I would have walked and driven past hundreds of times and then never noticed it never noticed it never seen it so it was tucked away yeah so that's, that's a lovely story that's how I found yeah that's how I found my little yeah little that is lovely good yeah so a, a tool for manifestation or at least putting your visions and your dreams out there and where you're going and That's where you great. want to be yeah I must say I don't use it for that purpose that often don't uh, you yeah uh, well, I, I do sometimes but primarily I think before we can manifest something I think we need to make space yeah <laughs> for this to come yeah so, so I tend to put in my pain and suffering and everything that's soul destroying everything yeah. that's I'm, I've been very fortunate that I've not experienced much I'm, I have to be careful not to minimize it I've not experienced a lot of personal severe trauma in my personal life but there's a lot of generational trauma especially from uh, my grandmother that's um, that's certainly been um, very important and I know that I've carried some some of that stuff and I've been processing a lot of that yeah. stuff and I think there's still plenty of work to do so yeah. whilst my own kind of experience of trauma has been kind of I would say mild in comparison to many people um, and that's another beautiful thing about Santre because it's so it can connect to really kind of Im implicit old stuff that doesn't even belong to you yeah, yeah. So it's almost like you can send distant healing healing to back to yeah those generations and let go of the of the stuff that we're still carrying cellularly absolutely That's, i yeah. know i've done a lot of that work both con both intentionally and unconsciously i've done a lot of yeah. that work yeah in the sand and would you say now what's the what's the kind of future for you masha is it mainly the creative therapies is it mainly sand tray is that where you want to devote yourself for the for the foreseeable i i don't feel can i don't feel i have to commit to anything particular forever um, no. you know before i got into therapies i never had a job for about 
more than about two years because I just liked variety. I, I, I think I'm here to stay as a therapist and uh, to, I love teaching. So um, I do love teaching. I do teach uh, sand play and um, a little bit of sound healing and a few other bits. I teach on trauma. I've, I've done quite a lot of trauma work and study. Um, so I don't want to say that, you know, I'm going to be doing this forever. I will be doing this for as long as I feel fulfilled and excited and uh, and warm and fuzzy whilst yeah. I'm doing this. Um, yeah. I really, really love it. You know, I love my room. I've managed to rent it on 1st of March at the beginning of the pandemic. So I spent a lot of time here on my own. <laughs> had the chance for a lot of exploration. So, so I love sharing this with people, um, you know, whether it's with clients or teaching small courses uh, it's a tiny room I can fit in about kind of eight ten people <laughs> uh, comfortably yeah. without sand trays with sand trays mm, less than that um, and um, so um, and I also run little retreats kind of every couple of months I run a sand and sound retreat where just mm -hmm. we make sand trays we do sound meditations we do some chanting some drumming and we just have a whale of a time um, as in good time they can be a little bit wailing sometimes <laughs> of course it can of course sometimes it can be really emotional for people but it it feels very nurturing it feels a very very special thing to do so I just like sharing this with people in whatever format I like sharing this with yeah. therapists I like sharing this with lay people um I like it for myself you know this is the room for me you know this I really yeah, amazing. Here. Yeah. Uh, I feel safe. I feel yeah. uh, I can be freely creative uh, in here. So I will do this for as long as it feels the right thing to do. I don't know. Tomorrow I might do astronomy. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? It's got to begin with another P, though, Masha. Whatever you do, it's got to be another P. Think about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for sharing it with us today. I'm just looking to see if there's any, there aren't any questions okay. at the moment, just somebody saying hello to us. Okay. Um, and I, yeah, it, I mean, for me, it's been fascinating. I hope it has for anybody that's watching in the group. I love it that you're in the group, Masha, and you post quite often on a Wednesday and what you're doing and what's going on. If people want to get in touch with you after watching this, what what website do they find you at? Okay, the best, my kind of most current website is uh, sandsoundcenter.co.uk. So uh, this is, I call this the Sand and Sound Centre and the website is sandsoundcenter.co.uk. Lovely. Lovely. Um, and yes, and you, you're so welcome to come and visit here and play yeah. with me. Yeah, uh, well, now where, where are you? Near Manchester. Near Manchester. It's, I'm about 30 minutes east of Manchester. If the traffic is not so bad, but it usually is bad. So a bit longer than 30 minutes. Okay. 30 minutes on the train. It's quite yeah. easy in the so, train. So for anybody listening further afield, it's not anywhere near Manchester. I'm really sorry. But maybe, maybe you can come to the UK to one of Masha's retreats at some point which would be nice and and in the meantime thank you um it's been sure. lovely catching up didn't realize it was quite so many years but yeah thank you for sharing that what i love doing is talking about different modalities and methods to healing in this group because you know trauma is trauma thriving is about us trying different avenues isn't it and 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 different methods mm. Um, and sometimes we need more than one method or two methods. We need a variety <laughs> at different points in the journey. So absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Lou. It's beautiful to talk to you. I, I don't know if I had a chance to talk for a whole hour. <laughs> like... I know, I know, I know. Not really. Not when it's not been about work or something. So, yeah, yeah. So to you and thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to today's podcast. I hope it helped you in some way and I really hope to see you back here soon. If you have anything to share on today's experience or podcast, please nip over to the YouTube channel or the Facebook group Trauma Thrivers and let us know there.